In 1986, Sir Run Run Shaw donated $110 million to CHK for the funding and founding of Shaw College. Since 1989, Shaw College has been inviting internationally distinguished scholars to visit the college, giving lectures in the middle of teachers and students of the college, as well as the university. This scheme was named as the Sir Run Shaw Distinguished Visiting Scholar to pay tribute to Sir Run Run's generosity for youth education. So some of you will know the story of how um, Coursera had gotten started. As a professor at Stanford University, for many years I was teaching a 400 student machine learning class. And it was about three years ago, just over three years ago, that a few students helped me put my class online and they reached 100,000 students. So I did the math, right? For me, to, and I realized that for me to reach a comparable number of students, 100,000 students, I would otherwise have had to teach at Stanford University for, you know what, 250 years. <laughs> and so building on the success of this early class, um, I invited a friend to join me on the project, and we wound up starting Coursera, which today partners with great universities to offer, um, to make a high quality education accessible globally. Um, and we've grown from, you know, at that time, two classes taught by uh, two Stanford professors to today having 117 partners in the US as well as all around the world, including um, you know, these two universities from Hong Kong. Okay, so you know that Hong Kong is very happy, so it's very happy that two Hong Kong <laughs> this is a class offered by uh, Rice University on Intro to Programming. Rice University built a um, Python, this computer programming language uh, uh, emulator, so that when you take this programming class, you can write computer software right there into your web browser. And by the time you complete this class offered by Rice University, you will have implemented for yourself a computer game, like an asterisk computer game, which you can play right there in your web browser. So this is the richness of experience that Rice University is able to offer to learners all around the world. Take a look at this list of words, and, and let me ask you, you know, what do these words have in common? Right? Like, wh why did I put up these words? One thing all of these terms have in common is if you do a Google search on any of these terms, um, a Coursera class, a class offered by one of our university partners on Coursera, shows up on the first page of Google's results. So if you search for financial accounting, you see, well, there's an ad that someone paid for, then the Wikipedia article, the Investopedia article, and then the um, Wharton class uh, offered on Coursera. And so right there on the first page, of Google's results is Wharton. Um, if you search for songwriting, um, this one I like. The very first link is actually a paid link that the Berkeley College of Music paid. Right, The first link on top is an ad. So Berkeley College of Music paid for that first link, um, and that's the first ad. And the first free link is the Berkeley College of Music uh, uh, course on Coursera. Right? Um, data analysis. You know, Wikipedia um, still beats us, but we're right after Wikipedia. Um, and then um, applying to US universities, right? The very first link is, um, you see, University of Pennsylvania. Some of our university partners have done calculations about the um, uh, SEO, search engine optimization value of this, and the numbers that they quoted were off the charts. I mean, how, I think, uh, to most universities, you know, it's not that bad when you, do a, when you do a web search to have your university show up as one of the top few items on that web search. And so I think um, through stepping up to give the world a great education, we are, I think, actually enhancing the brand of many of our university partners as well. Last Christmas, I was also in Hong Kong. Um, I think it was uh, the day after Christmas, December 26th. So I was chatting with my father. Um, my family has a, has a, maybe, actually my father and I, we have like a little family tradition where every Christmas, um, oh, it's Christmas Eve, yes, Christmas Eve last year. Every Christmas, my father and I, we go to the uh, uh, Wan Zai Din Lo Zhong Sam, you know, to, to, <laughs> um, 
but last year it was different, which is that my father and I were shopping at the Wan Chai Computer Center, and at one o'clock, my father looked at his watch and he said, oh my God, it's one o'clock, I have to go. And he left me there in the Wan Chai, you know, Zhong Sam, in order to go back to his hotel room to do Coursera homework. <laughs> So many learners um, spend hours, tens of hours, uh, doing these homeworks in order to complete these courses. And one of the things we wanted to do was when someone watches the lectures and does the homework and does well, we wanted to offer the learners a meaningful credential. You know, our mission is to create universal access to the world's best education. And I think that there's been this idea for a long time that society has talked about that Maybe education shouldn't be just for the elite. Maybe it shouldn't be just for the privileged, but that a great education should be a fundamental human right. Um, I think until recently, we never had the capability to make that idea a reality. But with digital technologies, um, I think we're just beginning. There's a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, there's lots that we haven't figured out. But I think with MOOCs and the ability to offer education inexpensively and at scale, um, I think that through our university partners, I hope that we can, over the next many years, actually make progress toward this idea of making education a fundamental human right. I want to thank you for the uh, course RA website. It is free for the education. And I think um, Coursera gives a lot of opportunity uh, to disabled students all around, and um, so they don't have to deal with a lot of um, uh, problems in access to education and so on. I attend some online seminars. For example, I took the I took the uh, online web web webinars uh, with uh, Professor Lacum, and it's very uh, interesting to ask questions on the online webinars, and we can have some discussion online. I think this is maybe a good suggestion for Cassara yeah, as sure. well. In the early days, some professors would go into the discussion forum. Um, and would try to answer every single question that students posted. And turns out there was this illusory effect, right? Maybe there are 10,000 students in the class, and you know, 200 of them are on discussion forum. Um, and uh, uh, when a professor goes into the discussion forum and answers questions, they see, wow, there are 200 students in the discussion forum. I'm going to answer all these questions. Because 200 people sounds like a lot of people. And the professor spent a lot of time doing that. But you know, it's just 2% of the class. And again, I don't want to be disrespectful of those who 200 person, because deep inside, I actually think every person is important. But what we found was that in terms of use of the professor's time, um, the professor should look at the discussion forum to get a sense of what's happening. But here's one hard data point. If a professor initiates a post in the discussion forum, it's read only very slightly more than when a student initiates a post in the discussion forum. So posting on the discussion forum, for the most part, is not an efficient tactic for the professor to communicate with students. Instead, what we now believe is that a professor should monitor the discussion forum to get a sense of what's happening, but the professor should then use broadcast tactics, basically email the whole class, a post an announcement, uh, in order to communicate with the whole class, rather than respond to students one at a time. So there are these very non-intuitive ways of thinking, because the human brain understands one student at a time, but we aspire to help professors have um, impact at scale. And unfortunately, a one-on-one -on -one experience is, or maybe fortunately or unfortunately, a one-on-one -on -one experience is the sort of thing that a university is great at delivering to its on-campus students and should keep on delivering, but unfortunately is not something that we know how to develop, uh, deliver economically to tens of thousands of students all around the world. Uh, the, the last question, probably related to what you have answered. Uh, and may affect a lot of our students' choice of their career. How do you compare the working environment at ba Baidu and other organizations you have worked with before? Do you see a new giant with true innovations growing up? Yeah. You know, um, there's something very strange that I see in China, which is that um, it might be Chinese culture or Chinese upbringing. I think most of us in Asia were raised to be relatively humble. There's a ton of stuff invented in China, um, but that somehow is, here's the strangest things, right? Some other countries, when they do something, they go, oh, I must have invented it, I'm so clever. In China, I feel like a lot of us 
maybe have a little bit more self-doubt. And even when I see people in China invent something, sometimes they look around and go, gee, I must have accidentally copied someone. Yeah. <laughs> and I think um, it's true that technologically, China, uh, 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 if you take like an average, right? Average technology in Beijing is behind average technology in Silicon Valley in the United States. China is behind, um, or Beijing is behind you know, California. But there are many, many bright spots in China where I think Baidu and other Chinese internet companies are already leading the way. Thank you.